Yeah, money only facilitates the exchange of value and goods. And that's ultimately what I think is important. If you concentrate even today on uh, learning about something and creating value and providing something uh, useful to society, uh, that's what makes you wealthy, I think. Governments could borrow and print as much currency as it wanted. They spend more than they tax the governments, and that's what the central banking uh, fiat currency system allows you to do. The government is now estimating that it could pay around $900 billion in interest alone. Yes, money can be corrupted, like you said, that it's been corrupted, it's been turned into nothing. Money that doesn't actually even exist. Mario, how are you, sir? I'm well, thank you, Chris. I hope you're doing well too. Oh, I'm always well when I get to speak to someone with um, not just a, a jolly nice character, but also someone with an incredible wealth, wealth of knowledge. The stuff you talk about on your channel, excuse the pun, it is gold. It It's kind of like what we all need to know to understand the... The not just the Babylonian money system, but the 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 encompassing slavery that comes off it. You know, what's your background? How did you get uh, an interest in in this and explaining it and explaining it to people? Well, I grew up uh, in Brazil, where we had a lot of inflation, so I was always interested in, in money. Uh, I've been in the UK since 1992. Uh, I worked in the city for 20 years. And I was involved in the bond markets, which is a very uh, is a, not a market fault in the mainstream. Whenever you hear uh, people reporting on the radio or the news, they say, "Oh, the FTSE did this and the pound did this." But the bond market is where uh, they set the the price of credit. It's very important. I have a, a university degree in international relations and economics, but I would say that I've learned more from asking questions and doing my own research that I learned at university. And, and uh, when uh, I was still in the city, I started questioning the system, um, the uh, the structure of the monetary system, and I started looking into it privately. And uh, ever since I've uh, left the city, I've been able to try to uh, tell the public what the uh, what the monetary system is all about and like like you said the babylonian system that we have that actually enslaves uh the majority of people and uh leaves the 0.1 percent uh with all the wealth uh and it's uh i'm sorry to say it's a scam and uh <laughs> the thing is most people are too worried about paying their bills to have time to look into these things. So I'm fortunate that I've, uh, well, not totally fortunate, it's just that I ask questions and uh, I, I like looking into things and um, that's what I've done. And that's what I try to uh, uh, tell my uh, viewers about. I um, uh, follow the markets, but uh, these markets are ultimately controlled by the people who control uh, the money or the currency. As I was saying to Mario earlier, I read this fascinating book that was re uh, recommended to me by one of our guests, Mike McCarthy. It's called The Babylonian Woe. And I only I can only remember about 2% of this book, folks, probably not even that. But what I got from it is the money system goes back to sort of um, uh, 8,000 8, years ago. Let's just say, for example... Back then, they would use things like cockle shells as a simple system of exchange. So you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But if I can't scratch yours, I'll give you two cockle shells. And these shells can be used anywhere in the region, perhaps, you know, almost, you know, internationally in regions like the Middle East. And that two cockle shells is recognized. That's a scratch of the back or paint your fence or fix your window or sell you a chicken, whatever it might be. 
And then the money merchants got involved or the greed mongers and they thought, right, we'll start these, we'll start a ledger and we'll lend cockle shells out to people that don't have them. And when they come to pay them back, we, instead of we lend eight cockle shells, we get eight back. We're going to lend eight and we're going to get 10 back. Known in biblical terms as usury, banned, I still believe, in certain countries in, in the Middle East. Money lending, folks, is what we're saying. Almost recognized in the Bible, uh, in, in, in um, one of the, the stories in there, that usury would lead to the enslavement of mankind. And as this went forward, they took this system into the churches and the palaces and they convinced the leaders of the time and the religious leaders that your wealth doesn't lie in looking after your people. Your wealth lies in accumulating these cockle shells. You know, the start of materialism, folks. Cockle shells obviously naturally turn to uh, or eventually turn to gold, silver, precious metals, gems. And so you had these people that should be looking after you suddenly convinced by these uh, very clever money people that know your wealth, your importance comes from how much gold you've you've got down in the vaults and will can funny enough will control that for you and then of course that's come forward through the centuries um, mario and we've seen fractional reserve banking so lending out this stuff that do money that doesn't actually even exist we saw the start of the central banking system I've said enough just to give, oh, and of course, we're now moving into an ultimate form of money that doesn't exist, which is digital money. Mario, that in itself, and I don't understand bonds. I, I have a rough idea of shares and all. The, I don't think I need to know that to know we got a serious problem here. What you said about the cockle shells is interesting. Uh, I've read up a lot on the Austrian School of Economics, and there's a, they have a, regression theorem analysis so you go back to see how things started and then uh, come forward and that's what they've done with money and uh money started actually before money you had a uh, direct exchange which is barter so like you said uh if you were uh i don't know uh you, you had a farm and you you had eggs and then you needed to to get some milk from another farmer but the the farmer that had the milk didn't want eggs so that was a problem uh, bartering is always a problem and what the Austrians talk about is uh, what evolved through time and it can be anything was the most marketable commodity it's a commodity that everyone wants and that actually uh you don't actually uh consume it uh and, and that's what money is and uh Yes, money can be corrupted, like you said, that it's been corrupted, it's been turned into nothing. But I, I think also uh, there's a good part of money, uh, which means that um, people can specialize and, and people can trade uh, uh, from di different locations to others because uh, a lot of places, let's say, uh, have something that you might want here in England that we don't have. So I think money is a good thing. It, it allows for specialization. I, I think we'd, we'd still be in caves or very primitive if, if we didn't have the concept of money. But the whole problem has been that, like you said, it's been corrupted. Yeah, money only facilitates the exchange of value and goods. And that's ultimately what I think is important. If you concentrate even today on uh, learning about something and creating value and providing something uh, useful to society, uh, that's what makes you wealthy, I think. And, and the money comes naturally with that because more um, people will want to uh, like uh, exchange with you. But <laughs> what we have today, though, is the central banks that started out in the 17th century. I think Sweden had the first central bank. But then you had the Bank of England, 1694. And what they've done is they, uh, first of all, we need to understand central banks, they're only there because the, the government gives them the monopoly. In the case of the Bank of England, it was the Royal Charter in 1694. And what we had here was a marriage between these money lenders that you talk about and the government. 
And why do they do that? Well, because the moneylenders benefit from the fact that they're lending to a nation. And when you lend to nations, you make a lot more profit. The monarch or the president or whatever, the government has the power of taxation. So it's almost like the bankers will never lose out because the uh, the head of state can always tax and they can always find crises uh, to justify these uh, the taxation and uh, the national debt prior to central banks. If a king or a queen wanted to go to war, they couldn't lumber it all on, on the public and, and a, there wasn't a national debt. But that's what the central bank has allowed uh, the bankers and uh, governments to do to increase the national debt. And the national debt in 1694 was two million pounds. Now it's approaching three trillion pounds. And uh, we finance that national debt. Uh, through inflation, through taxation. We've got the highest taxation in 70 years in the UK. And in government is really big as well. It's more than 50% of GDP. And uh, inflation, as you've seen, uh, is reflected in higher prices. That's the other thing they try to fool you. They, they tell you that food prices or wages cause inflation, but it's not. It's the fact that the central banks, they can issue uh, all this credit and money out of thin air to buy the government's uh, debt, which are called bonds. And then the government receives this funny money and spends it. And the people in the banking, uh, uh, at the top in the banking uh, community and the corporations around it, they get to use that uh, money first so and, and we get to use it later and it becomes less valuable and um so in in a world that i think would be uh more just you wouldn't have central banks you would have a free market in money uh and uh government wouldn't be involved and some people might might think we have a free market now that uh the, the corporations are too powerful but they're only powerful because they're actually connected to to the government. So that's how I, I see it in a nutshell. <laughs> so uh, maybe if you have some more questions. Yes. Could you, Mario, for those of us that um, have, haven't have put as much thought to these subjects as we'd probably like to, what the hell is the Nash? When you hear about America saying it's the richest, most powerful country on the planet, could you explain what that means for us? Yeah, so the national debt is uh, composed of uh, how much the government uh, borrows uh, and has to keep borrowing. And why is that? Well, because uh, they don't even uh, have enough. It, they spend more than the, they tax the governments. And that's what the central banking uh, fiat currency system allows you to do. And, and why do they do that? And why do they love this? Because, well, they can buy votes, they can enri enrich their friends, their their donors. So let's say that you uh, like have your budget, you spend, I don't know, 10,000 pounds a year and you take in 10,000 pounds. So you're fine, you're running a balanced budget. But if you start uh, spending more than you earn, let's say you you spend 12,000, then you have a debt of 2,000. So what you will do, you'll go to the central bank or a bank in, in your case, and they'll lend you 2,000 pounds. But instead, you pro you'd probably be thinking, well, I need to pay this off. And you, individuals usually want to pay off their debt. But with the government, they just keep accumulating it. And why do they do that? Well, because it benefits uh, the governments because they they keep borrowing and and they keep uh, buying votes <laughs> they keep, uh, keep looking good yeah and it benefits the bankers because they keep uh, the bigger the debt the more interest they get on it and uh, the reason also they tax you uh, is to make sure that um, they can control the inflation a little bit because if they create too much of this. Uh, debt and government spends too much, it might dilute the currency and it does. So they tax you. So they never let you. And the taxation as well, I would say, is uh, to keep the general public always, yeah, always uh, never having time to sit down and think and about things, always being worried about their bills. Because can you imagine 
if you didn't have to pay any tax, how much more time you'd have <laughs> and, and you wouldn't have any worries. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be good for the uh, accountancy business, <laughs> but it would be good for the general public. And uh, that's, that's the national debt. And uh, in the US actually, uh, in 1835 or 36, one of those two years, Andrew Jackson actually paid off the national debt and he actually did not renew the charter of the second bank of the United States because the United States had the first bank of the United States that chartered ended in 1812. And then I think it was restarted in 1816, the second bank. So the US had two central banks in the beginning of its uh, existence. Andrew Jackson didn't renew the charter, paid off the national debt, uh, but unfortunately, um, in 1913, uh, they created the, the Federal Reserve. That's the third uh, central bank. And uh, is it a coincidence that we had World War I start right after the Fed? Um, Fed was created because they, they helped finance that. And, and uh, usually the national debt is accumulated. The, uh, the wars really add to the national debt. The Napoleonic Wars added a lot to the UK debt, even though they paid off quite a bit of it in the 19th century. But then you had World War I, and the national debt went through the roof, not just here, but in the US. And, and I guess um, what we had in 2020, <laughs> that, that, that was kind of like a war. Uh, I would say, and, and that added massively to the national debt as well. Uh, the Bank of England created half a trillion pounds to buy government bonds, and they spent uh, all this money, so to speak, to keep people at home for 240 days doing nothing but still buying things. And uh, is it any wonder prices are rising now? I had a, a cheap Thai meal yesterday in the market. I used to love it, Mario, because it cost five quid for a big bowl of Thai food. <laughs> it's ten quid now. You know, in in it, like in two years, it's just it's so much more. So essentially, you've got the the the, the banking fraternity lending, the, the, you know, doing these deals with the government essentially to make money off off the the people. The same people who are in government are. are they're in the same network as, as yeah. As I mean, look at Tony Blair. He after he uh, uh, left as prime minister, he got a job with J.P. Morgan, and he was earning two million pounds a year. And and I heard when I worked in the city from people that worked at J.P. Morgan that all he did was go into uh, his office uh, for a few hours a week and the you know the junior people to come to come to his office and say, oh, Mister Blair, would you like a cup of tea and stuff that's all he did <laughs> and uh it's a revolving door and uh um, and that was basically his reward for uh, another banker's war uh, which was yeah. iraq iraq oh, yeah. and afghanistan that's right i mean that that it, i don't know if you've heard of uh smedley butler he wrote uh war is a racket he was a brigadier general he was one of the most decorated u.s marines and uh, he realized later on in life that he'd been fighting for for Wall Street and the bankers, not for freedom or democracy. They always have that excuse. And uh, I, I know it's difficult to tell people because, you know, a lot of people here in this country, their uh, grandparents and great grandparents fought in wars. And my wife, you know, always said, well, my uh, my grandfather and great grandfather they they thought they were fighting for something you know to make to save democracy and freedom but unfortunately it wasn't no mary you don't have to hold back on this show because i you know i'm ex-military i quote unquote put my life on the line on active service and and i think it's your duty as a veteran to learn this stuff although we all get it we know what it's like to have lost colleagues it's it's very highly traumatic for life but it's also simultaneously you're cementing the bank the next bankers wars for them because mm. they laugh at you they they literally belong to the same club and they they despise you um they, they did to, to you that you're just pawns on the 
on a on yeah a pawns chessboard. on the chess chessboard um so i pawns, think it's pawns in the game that's a really good book <laughs> you should look into <laughs> so i totally get smedley butler getting to the end of a military career looking back and going i've been used haven't i just wanted to go back to the national debt uh, because some people might be asking why don't we just uh abolish or like default on the national debt you know recently in the us they they had this uh debt ceiling crisis and a lot of people were saying are they going to default you know what's going to happen uh the flip side of the national debt is the money that we use the currency every pound in existence has been uh lent uh borrowed into existence by not just the government but also the the private banks so if you um let's say default on the national debt it's going to hurt a lot of people because you you have a welfare state you you have so many people now dependent on the government so you know the the private economy has been crowded out so that's the problem with the national debt but i'm afraid as well that uh it, it's just pure maths when uh when your debt increases so much and your income uh doesn't keep up there's going to be a point where you won't be able to service it anymore and I think we are at that point the the way they keep it going is by issuing more and more debt and having excuses like uh, we had in 2020 and we have now with the Ukraine and they keep justifying all this debt but eventually the private economy won't be able to keep up servicing that debt and I have a feeling it's all gonna collapse uh, just like it almost did in Greece in 2011, 2012. Um, I, I think it would have been a good thing for Greece if they had uh, defaulted on their debt. But unfortunately, uh, the bankers always seem to uh, be in, in charge. Like in Italy, uh, some years ago, they, they have what they call caretaker prime ministers. And they usually come from places like Goldman Sachs or other banks. You know, we have Rishi Sunak. You could say he's a pri pri caretaker prime minister, like like in Italy, because he wasn't he wasn't elected to be prime prime minister. So that that's the thing. The problem with the national debt they make the country so dependent on it that it's really hard to wean off the national debt. And if you do, uh, that's what why you should never believe when politicians uh, i mean i'm hearing uh jeremy hunt say a lot oh we're gonna pay down the debt he's not gonna pay it down what what he means is he's gonna inflate the system so much that the that the pound in your pocket is going to become worth less and less like your dinner last night and uh the debt be and when that happens the debt becomes easier to service because it becomes worth less but he's actually not going to uh, try to run budget surpluses and actually pay it off like we do he's just gonna inflate it away and uh yeah that that's what's happening yeah it's like trying to pay off your mortgage but um you know instead of actually paying off the 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 the, the loan you you use up <laughs> you use that money for something else and then you go back to the bank and say can I actually yeah have a bigger mortgage now please and 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 well you can actually if you uh if you do well enough for for example in terms of buying your house and uh you pay off some of your mortgage and then the value of the house goes up like it has been you know for the last 25 years what you can do you sell the house uh pay the mortgage off and buy a house with not a mortgage and so you, you can you know you can use this system to your advantage as well um mario let's talk about uh, again for our friends at home how was the gold and silver t you know leached out of the system and how do we end up at a point of fractional reserve banking where you've got the bank banks lending out money that they don't even have but then charging us interest on 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 that withdrawal or or on that loan yeah well the uh, gold and silver I, I think uh have been hijacked by governments 
Uh, gold and silver were, became money not because of governments. They became money in a free market, I would say. And what governments have done over the centuries is when they start wars, they usually suspend, if you have a currency, if the government, uh, they suspend the convertibility of that currency that the banks issue. Uh, and by suspending convertibility, it means that they don't allow people to get their gold or silver if they go to the bank. So, and why do they do that? Well, because it's the only way to finance wars. But what happened after the end of the wars, they would go back to normal money, uh, gold and silver. And the bank notes were just promissory notes uh, for you uh, to go back to your bank and say, I want my money back. So like after the Napoleonic Wars, there was a, a period from 1797 during the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars till 1821, where they um, they stopped the convertibility to because uh, the government had to basically take the, the gold and silver to finance the war. But after the war finished, they went back on, on a sound money system. And, and that's how it always happened. But unfortunately... Uh, after uh, World War I, they try to go back to uh, a gold and silver system. The problem was that World War I was so expensive that uh, Churchill, as a chancellor, tried to go back at the old exchange rate, and, and it didn't work. And then they just gave up on the, on the gold standard in 1931. The silver, and I've got here a, a crown from... George the third, as you can see here, the silver um, used to be nine to five. What does nine to five mean? It's sterling. It's the sterling silver content of the coins uh, in the UK were yeah nine to five until nineteen nineteen. So after World War One, the government spent so much and destroyed so much, and unfortunately, a lot of people died. They had to take the base, the silver coins. So what did, what did they do? Well, they still minted crowns, but it only had half of the silver. And that lasted until 1946. And then after 1947, <laughs> and that date is important because you had World War II. They kept ish minting these, but they took all the silver out. So that's how they, they took all the silver out of our money. And uh, the gold, they just... Uh, suspended it and you just kept using the promissory notes if you look at your bank of england note today uh, it still says i promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 10 pounds and that meant that you could go to the to any bank and get 10 sovereigns but <laughs> I, I i've called the bank of england before on the phone and said uh what do you mean by this promise and they said well it just means you can exchange this for a new note if it gets damaged and i said so why don't you write that on the note because this is misleading so yeah i'm saying it here uh the bank of england note is fraudulent so there you go so uh, i i realized that back in 2004 when i was at work i went to get my lunch and i was getting some money out of my wallet and i just looked at it and i had started looking into this already and i saw that promissory note and the notes back then, you probably remember, were bigger, so you could see it clear. And I said, wow. And then a few months later, uh, I got involved into looking at the Libertarian Party. And I went into to London for, for like a conference, and Boris Johnson was there speaking uh, at the, this Libertarian do. And, and then there was an economist there, Samuel Britton. I think he's passed away. He used to be an economist for the FT. And I took my 20 pound note out and I asked him the question about the system being completely fraudulent. And he looked at me and just like, <laughs> basically said, oh, what are you talking about? And, and just walked away. <laughs> Didn't want to like discuss it. I'm meeting a chap today, funnily enough, and he uh, he met one of the architects of one of the major events of our lifetime. I he he welcomed him into his business had to do a presentation for this guy and his little little click of people and he and it, and he said something like you know the bullshit around those three numbers folks you know those three numbers 
And uh, this guy who was one of the architects of that event looked at my friend and said, what? Are you a conspiracy theorist? Yeah. (laughs) Again, the fascinating thing that when we go and we say we borrow money for our mortgage, the bank don't have that money. They just... Yeah, they a lot just, of people. A lot of people. Normally, what it should be, let's say, you put like a hundred thousand pounds in the bank for save saving, and you say, I want to put it there for five years, you know, at three percent. So what <laughs> most people think is that the bank takes that hundred thousand and lends it uh, to Mr. Smith at four percent for a mortgage, but they don't. Like you said, they just they just write down a hundred thousand, and it's what. Uh, William Patterson said in 1694, the bank hath benefit of interest <laughs> created uh, from money out of nothing. And that's what the, it, it's not just the central bank, but the commercial banks, uh, they they create it out of nothing and, and they take your, your house, your property as collateral. So if you default on it, they own something for nothing. Yes, they... <laughs> <laughs> So that's fractional reserve banking. Um, I remember watching this incredible video that said when they brought the central banking system into the USA, they picked the the banking community. So, you know, the, the, I suppose these elite, Euro, what originally would have been European families, aristocracy, the banking aristocracy. They picked a day when everybody was distracted by a certain event. I can't remember what it was, but it was a big event. And they made their way to a place called Jekyll Island under false identities. So no one would know who these bankers were. They sat down at a table on their own and said, right, we're going to start the Federal Reserve. Reserve, And then we're just going to tell the government they have to have it. And the government went, oh, okay, we'll yeah. sign that one off. Can you tell us a bit about what, why is the Fed and the, you know, the, the Bank of England and all these central banks, why, why are they, you know, not in our interest? Well, because basically uh, the central banks, as I said earlier, uh, is a collection of the private bankers and they work together with government. And uh, what uh, the structure does is that it privatizes uh, profits. So the bankers always, when they make profits, they keep those profits. But if they have a a problem, because this fractional reserve system is very fragile, (laughs) you can have a lot of crises. So when you do, uh, you have what's called the lender of last resort. The central bank will come and save the private bankers and uh, the governments will save, will say, oh, we need to borrow a bit more. So they'll just issue more credit and the government will spend more and bail out the banks. So that's called uh, socializing the losses. So basically the private bank Private banks create the central banks uh, in order to make sure that if their uh, highly immoral fractional reserve game goes wrong, the public gets left with the bill and they always find a crisis to justify that. And then, but when they make a lot of profits, they keep those profits. So I think that's the uh, reason for the central bank. And there's a really good book called Our Crowd by Stephen Birmingham, and uh, he wrote about all the major uh, families that created this Federal Reserve. And in one section of the book, he's, he talks about uh, a guy, a banker called August Belmont, who actually was sent to the U.S. in 1837 by the Rothschilds. And um, in 1837, there was a huge uh, banking crisis uh, collapse in the U.S. And uh, August Belmont, who was very young at the time, he was able with Rothschild money to buy all these assets at a, for pennies on the dollar. And uh, in the book, though, it says, <laughs> because the book is written by this guy in the 1960s, and he interviewed actually members of these families, like old aunts and grandmas and stuff. And, and the book said, August Belmont and the Rothschilds 
acted like the Federal Reserve. They came in and bailed out everyone, you know, after this uh, crisis in New York and the, in the financial system in 1837. So the Federal Reserve in 1910, you had the 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 bankers, the, and they're the same people from this crowd, our crowd. They're meeting in Jekyll Island. So why do they meet there? What was the uh, excuse for having a, a central bank? Well, because in 1907, there's a huge crash uh, that was triggered by the earthquake in San Francisco. And uh, JP Morgan, he had to come in and bail everyone out, organize the bailout. And uh, I think JP Morgan, uh, many people don't know, JP Morgan Bank started out in London. And I think the Rothschilds are heavily behind the JP Morgans. So I, I think what happened in 1907, uh, the bankers said to themselves, we need to do something about this. We almost lost everything in 1907. So they came up with the idea of uh, a central bank in the US to make sure that uh, when they did uh, have trouble with their schemes, that the public would come to the rescue through the central bank. And the way they sold the central bank uh, uh, was uh, to say that they're going to make the currency more flexible, that it would end bank runs and collapses. But it didn't do any of that. I mean, up <laughs> last March this year, we had the one of the you know, two, three biggest collapses in banking in the US. Uh, the, the currency has lost 99% of its value since the Federal Reserve was created. When they finally were able to write the uh, Federal Reserve Act, uh, they, they put it to a vote in Congress on December 23rd, 1913. Uh, and December back then, there were no uh, flights or aerpl airplanes and uh, travel took a long time. So most of the uh, people in Congress had gone home for Christmas already, and that's how they sneaked it through. And the president, of course, was Woodrow Wilson, and he he was, you could argue, bought and paid for it by the bankers. He was put there by the bankers, so he made sure that he signed the Federal Reserve Act into law. And he actually, uh, I don't have the comment here, but he he quoted, he said that that was the biggest mistake he he made. Uh, I mean, you could look that up, uh, Woodrow Wilson on his regret about signing the Federal Reserve Act. And there were a lot of people back then who were in Congress who tried to warn people uh, against the Federal Reserve. But again, they were dismissed as well as being, you know, conspiracy theorists, even though I don't think they had that term at the time. Uh, one of them was uh, Congressman Charles Lindbergh, who was the, the father of the aviator, mm -hmm. uh, Lind the, the guy who flew across the Atlantic. And uh, ironically, <laughs> Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, married uh, the daughter of a J.P. Morgan partner. So <laughs> there you go. It's quite fascinating when you see how the, the, the big club, you know, they, they, they network and they, they get their, uh, we say, grubby mitts into, <laughs> into everyone else's <laughs> family fortunes. Um, and also the thing, I think... Uh, uh, if I understand it right with with this central banks is because they control the base rate, the uh, the interest rate, when they raise it, as we saw this in the 90s, when I managed to buy a house for a third of its value because the poor people that bought it brand new nine months before me, they'd mortgaged up to the hilt like most people do because you don't think it's ever going to happen. The rate went up. This poor couple with their first brand new house couldn't afford a mortgage that has gone, let's say, in modern times from a thousand pound a month. It's suddenly gone to three thousand. You just know who, who can. So, so the banks repossessed their poor house, and then they sold it to me at a third of the price. Now, if you have that control over the interest rate, Mario, am I right in thinking? when you put it up there isn't the money in circulation to pay these debts back so people default and then the big companies remember it's all a big club folks it's all one big network they say oh right 
we'll hoover up all these small independent cafes in the high street. And guess what's coming? We're going to put a big Costa coffee there. You know, mm. do you see they've, they've yeah. sucked all that wealth up into yeah. their network and they replace it with their corporatized, you know, the same with the pub, uh, you know, the, I mean, it's slight, slightly different, yeah. but, but we've lost it's all, all the pub. Uh, it's all a matter of maths, uh, uh, a little bit on the fractional reserve system and how it favors the bankers and over centuries, it basically enslaves the general public. So I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, a farmer need uh, has a has a farm that's worth a hundred pounds and he grows uh, wheat there or she grows wheat and the yield from the the farm every year is three or four percent so they make a fairly decent living uh, and then you have the banker who let's see let's say takes in a hundred pounds in deposit uh let's say the the bank of england or a, a commercial bank and they'll lend a, a thousand pounds on the back of that and they'll lend it to you at five six percent so <laughs> they're making like multiple times of what the farmer is making and and when you uh control that for centuries uh is it any wonder that um yeah the bankers almost own everything now in the big corporations and uh, the landowners, the farmers, they're, you know, they don't have as much as they used to. So it, it's just a matter of math. So you extrapolate that fractional reserve. It, it, it's worse than, a, I would say, a loan shark because a loan shark at least has the money to lend to you. Uh, the bankers don't. <laughs> and uh, they actually make uh, de facto more interest because they're making five or six percent, not on a hundred, but on a thousand. And they've only got a hundred, so that's how we've come to where we are right now. And um, I don't think the political system uh, will help any. Even the Labour Party, who's supposed to be a party for the people, he's come out and said that uh, he wants to uh, Starmer, that is, to to buy f uh, land from landowners. Uh, at below market value, you know, how, how is that fair? And um, the reason people are so hard up is not because of, uh, yeah, it's because of the system. That's what it is. And and I'm afraid to say the political system is also a distraction to divide people. So people don't look at the this uh, this problem, which is the, the money system. That's the big problem. And, and why do I think it's the biggest problem? Well, because half of all you know when you make a do a, a commercial transaction half of that transaction is to do with money so like you said if the bankers control the uh, base rate and, and the loans and the currency and it's a monopoly uh, they control everything exactly exactly there's three things I'll come on to, Mario, and I am uh, aware of your you kindly giving us all this time. Um, and I'll, I'll name them in no particular order, but one of them is BRICS. And I'm going to hold my hand up and say, I keep hearing it mentioned. I honestly don't know anything about it. The second thing is the petrodollar and how that related, for example, to Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein, who I believe didn't want to trade their oil in the in 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 the dollar, and then the final thing, you know, it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk about central banking, um, digital currencies, and the way the whole digital ID thing is going. So, should we take BRICS or the petro dollar first? We'll go to BRICS then. Uh, I mean, BRICS is an acronym for. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and it was actually um, thought up, thought up by uh, an economist from Goldman Sachs, an English economist for Goldman Sachs, and uh, but uh, it's been used now by by those countries to uh, create a, a block um, to challenge basically the G seven, and why is that? Well, because the G seven used to be very powerful in the 80s and 90s but uh, the uh, economic growth of china india russia brazil has made them you know relatively more important and they want to have a say 
So they've created this block. Uh, they're talking about creating their own uh, reserve currency. And why is that? Well, because the dollar has been used uh, as a weapon um, against these countries. And I'm not taking signs. I'm just telling you mm -hmm. why it's happening. So that's the BRICS in a nutshell. Uh, the petrodollar, we have to go back to 1971. And why is that? Well, that's when Richard Nixon closed the gold window. <laughs> uh, that's how they call it. But they because from 1944, when uh, towards mm -hmm. the end of World War II, they created the Bretton Woods system, and under that system, the dollar, uh, thirty-five dollars, uh, were backed by one troy ounce of gold. So the world was basically on a semi-gold standard. And why semi? Because all the other currencies weren't on, on a gold standard, but they were pegged to the dollar. But by 1971, the United States had printed too much, too many dollars without backing. And the French, the British, and other countries were going to the treasury with their paper dollars and saying, I want my gold. <laughs> so, And they didn't have enough gold. The US would have gone bust if Nixon, uh, he said he was... Uh, suspending the convertibility of the dollar into gold temporarily and here we are in 2023 and it's still suspended so uh yeah this is about the petrodollar of course so what happened after 1971 well the dollar became very weak it dropped a lot versus gold and people uh like in europe wanted to reinstate a gold standard in europe and it would have like uh put a lot of uh, the power of the US, it would have eradicated a lot of the power of the US. So people didn't trust the dollar anymore because it wasn't backed by anything. So the Americans found found a way <laughs> to increase demand for dollars. So they went to the Saudis um, and uh, said, we will protect your kingdom and uh, you know from enemies, but the condition is that you sell all your oil in dollars. And what does that do? Well, that means that uh, every country in the world that buys oil, and the reason why uh, it becomes important is because Saudi Arabia is the biggest producer. So even other countries that produce oil started dealing in dollars. And, and when they receive those dollars, what do they do with it? Well, they go and buy, let's say, U.S. government bonds, and it keeps interest rates low. So that's what the petrodollar did. It was basically a way to support the dollar uh, after, you know, it, it defaulted on its gold obligations. But, yeah, and America has had the, the privilege, basically, to issue uh, the dollar and buy anything they want anywhere else, while other countries like the UK and anyone else, if we want to buy something from abroad, we have to earn in dollars to pay for everything. Every good thing comes to an end. And uh, <laughs> the flip side of this privilege the US has had is that they've they've indebted themselves up to here. Like you said, you know, it's, the national debt is like 32 trillion. It's probably going to go to 34 in the next 18 months. And so I get go back to the BRICS. The BRICS, you know, Saudi Arabia wants to join now the BRICS. And, um, and they realize that the dollar is not as good as gold anymore. They issued too many of it. And the petrodollar is on its way out. So uh, what that will mean for the dollar and for Americans is that there's going to be less demand for dollars. So... Uh, everything is going to be more expensive for them and um, because interest rates are going to go up. And it's going to be the same thing for us here because our currency and, and the European currencies were always backed by a lot of dollars. And uh, so, and your third question was about, can, so we had can that. I, can I just ask yeah. a question? Yeah. So, so the club, as I, as I call it, so these yeah. European aristocracy bankers, mm. Do they not, you know, through their network, control Saudi Arabia and and um, you know, uh, was it Brazil? You, 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 you Russia, you, yeah, China. Right. yeah. You, you I, know. I think they do, you know, because you look back, <laughs> and, and some people might find it strange, but the Americans finance the um, the communists, and they finance 
finance also the nationalists, you know, in the civil war in China. Mm -hmm. Nixon went to China and back in the 70s for detente with China. Up until then, uh, in the UN, China was Taiwan. <laughs> and, and then Nixon opened, you know, changed all that. So, yeah, they control them as well. But uh, I, I think the power is shifting to uh, to those countries. And uh, they're probably involved with these countries too, these uh, these families, but they don't care because they will make a lot of uh, probably a lot of money from from the BRICS. Uh, it, it's the general public that's going to suffer. So, I mean, the, the, sorry to interrupt, Mara, but just fine. for our friends at home to understand, so the club folks, you know, this elitist network that that seems certainly to have been very strong in the last four hundred years. But as we've established, actually goes right, probably right back to the, you know, the original corruption of the money system. They're not just happy to destroy Europe, to level it flat. Millions upon millions of deaths of all, all peoples, including whichever, you know, nationality they belong to. Um, and they've done that twice now. Um, um, but then they moved on to America and used the good, beautiful people of America who were very humble and could we say a bit naive because they love their country. And why wouldn't you? It's a beautiful country and Americans mm -hmm. are such nice people. But they then used the America's uh, sense of national pride against them to to keep their you know, Star Spangled Banner flying, but at the same time is leeching everything from under them so yeah. that their country is now just about to collapse with the biggest debt of all. Yeah. Well, they did that. They did that to the British Empire and the British people. Yeah. Now yeah. they moved on to China. China's the play that. Do, yeah. do, this and is it's, what it's weird because if you look at the Oxford University, for example, they have something called the Rhodes Scholarship that was created by the Rhodes Trust, Cecil Rhodes. And, and that's supposed to uh, finance uh, American students to come and uh, study at Oxford. And Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar and so on. And, and <laughs> did you know that Oxford University now has also a Rhodes Scholarship for Chinese students? And these are not Taiwan students. And it's financed by uh, Blackstone, <laughs> a huge private equity group. Mm -hmm. So they, they keep telling us that China's bad, she, we're going to go to war, but they're still dealing with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and back in the 30s, uh, the Wall Street bankers, they financed Germany. They built up Germany. In the last 25 years, they've built up China, Russia, <laughs> and now they're our biggest enemies. I think it's just a, it's just a game for them. And uh, but you, they make may they make it seem that it's uh it's real for us for the general public. And if we look at all of that history, Cecil Rhodes and we had didn't we we had the East India Company. Basically, the front I, I call it the club because it's just this. Yeah, like clearly, George Carlin said, you he, it's a big club. Yeah, it. yeah, <laughs> and there's different layers of the club. There's the real. Clever people, well, don't even want to say that. And But then they have their la layers of what we would just call them puppets of different intelligence. Um, some of them not really, <laughs> not not really that smart at all. Um, not referring to um, two generations of uh, American president there. But <laughs> um, my, my point is this system of just, I, I don't like, to use that word, let's just say raking the heart out, out, you're raking the wealth out of these countries, the gold out of South Africa, the diamonds, the incredible mineral wealth that they have down there in Africa, the fish, the copper. Now it's lit. lit I mean, it's nothing new, is it? It, it? So when you mention there's a Cecil Road, yeah, it, it, I absolutely have. Uh, you know, I have, I have no doubt. Yeah. 
And so we we covered BRICS, petrodollar. What was the? Uh... We were going to do the central banking digital currency. Oh yeah, CBDCs. Yeah, I I think you know uh, if we look back at money and like we have, uh, I spoke about how it used to be golden, you know, gold and silver coins, and then they issued the uh, warehouse receipts. And then uh, the governments hijacked that and took the gold and silver out of the system. So you had to have the warehouse receipts as money because the cash that we have today, the pay, the pay, the banknotes, they're not really money. <laughs> so CBDC would just be the next step in taking away from real value, which is gold and silver. And uh, yeah, and it would put you in a, a uh, prison because if you did something that um, the bankers and that's not just government but the banks as well because they'll follow all these rules if you did something that they didn't think was right they can freeze your account but if you have cash you can keep cash outside the system uh and and that's why i, I tell a lot of my viewers that you need to have some physical gold and silver coins that's why uh, I like having some of these and I have uh, Thrupney uh, bits as well, three pence. They're all silver coins. So, yeah, that's what the CBDC will do. There will be a total, uh, I guess, a total uh, slavery, I would say. And um, I'm not trying to be <laughs> dramatic here, but that's what it means. The CBDC. Well, you, you're not being dramatic because I mean, let's be honest. We are talking about the the uh, again. I don't want to say the words, folks, because it it triggers certain software. But you know, we are talking about the NWO. Yes, yeah. they they have a gameplay. You don't play Monopoly, and everyone who sits at the table, you know, drinking their sherry at Christmas, like nobody wants to win it there's always that person isn't they that well you don't care and you're dropping your money in your houses everywhere because you're you're a bit pissed they've got the you know the money up their sleeve under the table they 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 are going to win at every cost life is no different <laughs> um especially when you have this strata of individuals that think the rest of the world is scum Mm. um that that think by birthright you're you you're you're really undeserving and you're just is it chattel is that the word like cattle yeah you know, chattel. For, for, for their own amusement and yeah. and uh what with uh, what, what with you know populations and stuff it's not difficult to see why if you're in this elite club you might want to get rid of a few people um before they concrete like the whole planet before they eat the whole of the rainforest because <laughs> um you, you know it, it, i don't think you're being dramatic uh, at all mario i think these are incredibly real issues i say um i was uh, chatting with mick yesterday and uh, we were just saying how it's all well and good saying digital currency is fine and you have it on a you know a just have a card or yeah wherever. it's always uh, convenience isn't it yeah. they, they sell convenience they sell that on convenience but the problem is when it's all controlled by by a central system you could rock up to do your supermarket shopping and suddenly and this is just an example folks i know the supermarket girl isn't going to say this but you know your 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 credit is declined and when you say, I'm sorry, what, what are you talking about? I've got, I've got lo lo loads of money in the bank. They say, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Thrall. Did, did you attend a protest in London last week? <laughs> you know, were you objecting to, you know, maybe a certain procedure that, that they want to, that the whole population is going to be. Yeah, I was actually. Yeah. There you go, sir. Well, you know? I was reading something, an article uh, someone sent me just before we came on and it was about uh goldman sachs they 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 work with apple in the us to provide uh people uh, an apple bank savings bank and an apple debit or credit card and a lot of people were complaining they couldn't move their money from their apple i.e goldman sachs accounts and one of the things that people at goldman sachs said is that they they have to maybe sometimes conduct anti-money laundering and know your client things which is basically 
uh, banks shouldn't be involved in that. That's for the police, I would say, if you are a criminal. The, but what happened is people got their money blocked at Apple Bank because, let's say, uh, you put $10,000 in your bank, uh, Apple Bank, or 10,000 pounds, and then you take that and you transfer it to another account, uh, it will trigger these anti-money laundering things and they'll freeze your account. So it's not just the government, but these banks are going to be doing that too. The thing is, if it's your money, they shouldn't do that. It's like when you go to your uh, bank now, if you go to the branch and you want to take, let's say, 2,000 pounds cash, they ask you so many questions. And uh, a lot of times I just say, it's none of your business. It's my money, but I'm afraid you know, they're going to get a lot tougher. So what's the way... To take the other problem is if you take your cash out of the bank, which I think is not a bad thing to have some cash, but they could also demonetize it. Uh, in India, they did that a few years ago. They gave people 48 hours to uh, exchange their uh, bank notes for new ones. So uh, they, they can control you. Am I right in thinking or, or suggesting if it's a central banking digital currency, then technically the world the central banks of the world could unite in governing it and mm -hmm. and 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 the dealing yeah so it really would be like the new world yeah and and the bank that would run that would be the bis in basel the banker bank for international settlements which was created in 1930 uh by an international treaty in the hague by <laughs> by the major european countries and the bankers and um but i think uh i've read up on the uh britcoin the bank of england digital currency uh they would be of course behind it like you said but the wallets would be they would outsource that to private companies or to normal banks but ultimately uh and they say in their white paper the bank of england that they wouldn't have access um, the 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 private companies would be in charge of the accounts, so they wouldn't see anything. But I can bet, <laughs> I, I can bet they will have access to it. You know, this is just them trying to say, oh no, it's not going to be any bad because you're going to have your own private wallet supporters, you know, digital wallet providers, and we're not going to do anything. But um, uh, I think it's, it's a nefarious uh, nefarious endeavor by the by the central bankers and many people think they'll bring it in by bringing in uh, a collapse of this fiat currency system uh, and it's possible uh, but the other uh, danger for them though is that people wake up and that's why i keep doing my videos and i'm coming on your show if people wake up and they realize that they're doing this by design and when the crisis happens and they come out and say oh this is the solution to it, the CBDC. Hopefully a lot of people will say, no, I don't want to deal with you anymore. You created this collapse and uh, we don't want your solution. And of course, they're going to try to uh, blame anyone but themselves. They'll, have, they'll blame uh, Russia or uh, aliens for, for the collapse or anything, but uh, they, they are actually the ones behind it. You mentioned people should buy gold and silver or have some of it. Would that be any use if if the money system collapsed tomorrow and people, let's just say within a week, are starving and their families are, you know, within three weeks, the family's starting to die. I, I just see rampage, rampaging gangs. Yeah, um, no, there's yeah been, that's true. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. And there's a really good book uh, written by Lionel Shriver. She's an American uh, author, but she lives in the UK called the mandibles i recommend it and it's like dystopian like you're uh, describing there but uh for example i have a viewer from kent uh and i talked about the threat thre threepenny bits that i bought a few weeks ago the silver ones and they have a farm and they said mario whenever you want to come over we will gladly sell you our eggs and uh strawberries for for silver so I, I mean it, it it could come in handy but like you said uh in a mad max world uh yeah I, it wouldn't really help
But I think if we're able to get through uh, the troubles and a better world, then you will still have that to to be able to uh, use that for for your advantage and also to help people. It's not just for you uh, because, you know, when gold and silver, they, they never really lose their value. You know, you find coins that have been buried for thousands of years. And so um, the reason, I mean, I don't tell people to buy gold and silver. I tell them what I'm doing and I try to tell them what it what it's about. And a lot of them do. And uh, it's also a protection against inflation because they're going to continue to issue a lot of the currency um, because it's the debt and they have to keep it going. And, and it's just a simple law of supply and demand. The more you supply of something, i.e. the currency, the less valuable it becomes. And gold and silver, are uh, they're not really easy to come by. <laughs> they're rare and that's why they're money. Yeah. Friends, I wasn't trying to be scaremongering then. I, I believe we create our own future and we do it by making the spiritual connection, which all this fear drops away. Because, for example, and I, I think I have a feeling Mario would agree with me here, when you Mario mentioned Keith Starmer, I, I honestly didn't know who he was. I know he's in the news a lot. Yeah, Keith Starmer, yeah. Yeah, but I don't watch mainstream media, folks. I, you wow. know. My wife and I haven't watched, uh, we haven't had uh, a TV license since 2015, and we don't watch TV. Good. Uh, but and you this is a glimpse of news. But yeah. I, I agree with you, is you have to switch off and uh, uh, because they want to keep you uh, in, uh, in fear, and fear is not a good emotion. Mm -hmm. Lionel Shriver is interesting. Could, didn't she write, We need to talk about Kevin? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Which uh, was uh, I didn't write read that one, but one of my viewers recommended the mandibles, and that and that's really a, a good one. Yeah, it seems uh, I, I can't get too deep into this, folks, for the same reasons. But it's interesting. We were talking yesterday, Mary, in the podcast. But w I mean, I'm an author of six books. I actually best selling. I was number two best selling author in Hong Kong for for a while. But but here's the thing. It is incredibly hard work. My suggestion is I think the books get picked again by the network. Mm. Um, when you see books uh, like the other one about the apocalypse was uh, The Road, wasn't it, by Cormac McCarthy, about this dystopian future where there'd been some big disaster. You never got to know what it was. Um, and Lionel Shriver, she wrote, she's written this apocalyptic book, but she also wrote one about a, a guy that went a bit banzai in school, if you, you know, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, you, I wouldn't. Put it, yeah. People it, will put narratives in your head, folks, and you don't even know it, you know. That's you true. Don't, you don't even know it. So I think we're all agreed. Um, a good place to start, Mario, isn't it, is turn off that. Don't stop listening to that mainstream. Don't be the person that has the BBC as your source of information. Even if it's like, oh, but I just wind down, Chris, at the end of the day. I, I don't take it. Sit Come on, you do, don't you? Let's be honest. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know. yeah, BBC, I mean, it's such a, I mean, the, you look at the, they're run by the bankers too. I, mm -hmm. I think uh, some years ago, the head of the BBC was a guy called Marcus Agius, and he was a son-in-law of a Rothschild. And now the latest guy, Sharp, former Goldman Sachs. So it, it's a yeah. British brainwashing the, corporation. Yeah. <laughs> what an incredible guest, folks, eh? Um, absolutely brilliant. I thank you on behalf of the next generation for, for what you're doing. And I wish everyone was as brave as you, Mario. But we can only live our lives, can't we? And we can only fight our own spiritual battles. And I think that's most important is to work on ourselves, folks. And uh, it's great to have a guest that's that's just done, obviously done that, and then is giving so much back to, to society. Mario's links will be below. Um, Mario, I'll ask you in a moment. Uh, 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 let's not do it now, but if there's, I know you've got some social media and that sort of stuff, but they'll all be below, folks. Please support Mario because... Um, 
you know we need to support the content creators that are doing their best to 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 end the madness and that just leaves me to say if you could support me i'd really appreciate it if you could click like subscribe the little bell thing um and i really look forward to seeing you soon much much love